Very good. And then um, the following week, we'll have Christmas Eve services, 5 o'clock right in here with the praise band, and then uh, 7 o'clock up there in the sanctuary. So that's for Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day, up in the sanctuary, there'll be communion, 10 o'clock. That one is a 10. I know that one. Okay. So, great. If there's nothing else, then uh, please rise for the invocation. We begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Welcome this morning. Join with us and sing out now, nice and loud, praising Jesus.
Um, sometimes that sounds scary. You can't get away from the Lord. Like we want to run from him. This goes all the way back to the beginning, right? Adam, where are you? And then he plays the blame game, makes up some stories. But all the while, God chases us down. We can't get away from him because he wants to love us and forgive us. That's what he's after. And we are instead afraid and running. But he takes that initiative. And we love him because he first loved us. So let's lovingly go to our Heavenly Father right now and confess and hear those words of absolution once again. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Rejoice in the Lord always. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and sign shall flee away. This is the word of our Lord. Our epistle reading comes from James chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the yearly and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, 
take the prophets and who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of, steadfastness, fastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is, is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of our Lord. Jesus Christ for the reading of the gospel. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to, it, to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. He will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Oh, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Christ. You're going to go first or am I going to go first? You may be seated now for our next song.
you make beautiful things. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about what God can do with a barren desert, wilderness. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A voice crying in the wilderness. We recognize that voice. We've been hearing a lot about John the Baptist these last few weeks. In the wilderness. That's where John's voice came from and could be heard. Faintly at first, as you get farther and farther away from the ceaseless sounds of the city, and you keep going deeper and deeper into the wild, that haunting voice of the prophet crying out in the wilderness would become clearer and stronger, too strong even, too loud and clear for some folks, some folks in high places like Herod the Tetrarch, right? That relentless voice of John's, untamable like the wilderness whence it came. Yes, the wilderness. The nation of Israel recalled the wilderness well also. The stories that they must have passed down from one generation to the next generation about their 40 years sojourn, wandering in the wilderness. Then there's Jesus. Jesus also knew that wilderness, and that's exactly where he first headed out for at the very, very beginning of his earthly ministry. In fact, it was just after his encounter with John the Baptist that Mark's gospel describes Jesus, still wet from his baptism, mind you, now immediately being driven out into that wilderness by the anointing spirit, the spirit who had just alighted upon him at his baptism. This is Mark chapter 1, verse 12. The spirit immediately drove him, Jesus, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, unquote. Interesting passage there from Mark. I quote Mark there because while the important event of Jesus' baptism is recorded in all four Gospels, it's only in Mark's Gospel where we find the comment about Jesus being out in the wilderness with the wild beasts. Mark just slips that little factoid in there about the wild beasts somewhat curiously. I find it interesting because our Old Testament lesson today from Isaiah 35 has a lot to say about the wilderness. Did you notice that? Isaiah 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus, that early blooming flower in the iris family. A bunch of wild beasts out there are also mentioned by Isaiah. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, verse 7. And now notice this description from verse 9 in our Isaiah reading. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ra ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. That's verse 9. What's happening in this desert, you might rightly ask. You start with all this dry land, quote-unquote burning sand, thirsty, thirsty ground, as I say, initially describes the scene, and then it miraculously changes. And we really want to know how, as Southern California folk, don't we? Especially in this drought-stricken time in which we find ourselves. We're looking at water rationing, building or refurbishing some desalination plants, and just, in general, desperately concocting any inventive and hopefully economical way to deal with this fire-prone desert terrain that we Angelinos call home. So what's the secret behind this, well, wonderful terraforming, as some would be tempted to describe it, this transformation described in Isaiah's prophetic wilderness? Starts out a barren wilderness, a wasteland, a veritable valley of the shadow of death, but ends up blooming and gushing forth with refreshing streams. Its inhabitants, the ransom of the Lord, as Isaiah calls them, they're now singing with mirth and joy and gladness. What accounts for this new Eden? Where even sorrow and sighing flee away. Mind you, this is yet a 
far off future event that the prophet Isaiah sees through his faith-filled eyes. But the pivotal point that's going to make all the difference is, well, Advent. Advent, that is the Lord's coming. The arrival of the Lord makes all things new. Of course, who else could it possibly be, right? But it's a little more nuanced than that. Oh, yes, Jesus came. Jesus conquered. But it is the manner in which. It's the manner in which the Lord Jesus Christ conquered. That is, eventually, he'll enter Jerusalem, the holy city, humbly riding on a donkey. And later, he dies outside the city on a criminal's cross wearing a crown of thorns. These are some early signs of this kind of unforeseen weakness that has John the Baptist scratching his head in prison. And it's got the rest of us scratching our heads a little bit too, if we're honest about it. At least we are not in prison, and we still have a head to scratch. And that was the tenuous situation which we find the baptizer in in our gospel lesson today. John is in prison awaiting sure death, barring a miracle. So in this predicament, John begins kind of second-guessing himself. I thought the Messiah to come was supposed to set all the captives free. Well, I'm exactly not that. And John's not all wrong there either. After all, is, not, is this not the prayerful plea that we ourselves echo in the songs of Advent? I mean, in Advent sing, season, we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel. One might presume this ransoming would include God's prophets in jail. Not that John would have known the song, of course. As old as that Emmanuel song is, by the way, some 1,200 years old in the original Latin. Nevertheless, John is still centuries older than that still. So if not the song, John certainly would have at least been well acquainted with all the messianic hopes and fears all the years of all the people, of all the prophecies like Isaiah's pinpoint accurate prophecies regarding the Messiah. So what does John do in his prison predicament? He sends an inquiry via emissaries from his prison cell. They find Jesus and they ask John's question, are you the one? Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus' ready-made answer is, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me, John. This answer that Jesus sends back to John comes right out of Isaiah's prophecy today written some 700 years before Christ. The evidence, then, of these prophesied miracles that are now all being performed by Jesus, they offer clear proof that Jesus indeed is that one whose coming was foretold. So then why does Jesus add that last sentence for John? Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. Well, please notice here, there is an important omission going on here that gives some insight into this question. One part of Isaiah's oracle here in chapter 35 is deliberately left out by Jesus. It's from verse 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God that is, divine retribution, in other words, deserved punishment, you will get yours. That's judgment day language. And despite Jesus conspicuously leaving that part out, that is nevertheless exactly what first century Jews wanted to hear. They themselves were suffering under Roman oppression, so they were earnestly praying for a political Messiah to rise up and deliver them militarily and exact vengeance on all their enemies to clear out of the promised land the hated stranger. 
and reestablish their own throne. Certainly that kind of final judgment day will come, and it will come against all the kingdoms of the world. You can count on it, but be careful what you ask for. This day of reckoning and wrath to come will also be fulfilled by the same Jesus Christ when he returns at his second advent. Jesus is going to return as the heavenly crowned king and judge of the entire universe. But this is not the purpose of his first advent. Thankfully, mercifully, any divine wrath and judgment that rains down from heaven above during the Messiah's first advent Well, it rains down upon Jesus himself, the one John the Baptist declared to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus takes our sin on and takes our sin away, removing it from us as far as the east is from the west. Amen? Jesus, the obedient son with whom the Father is well pleased, and the one on whom rested the full anointing of the Holy Spirit without measure. This righteous Jesus suffers in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God, Peter says in his epistle. With his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, he ransomed us from the fall. Because Jesus mercifully died in our place at his first coming, Those who trust in him now and are baptized in his name, they do not need to fear the pent-up wrath of God that's surely coming and will be poured out at Christ's second coming against all evildoers. People who have rejected God's free gift, free offer of grace and forgiveness. Those who opt out of grace and wish to face God's penetrating judgment on their own merits Without mercy, without the merits of Christ, they will get what they ask for, righteous judgment and eternal separation from God. I'd plead for mercy instead, wouldn't you? It won't go well for all those who reject God's mercy. That is why the psalmist pleads, and this is echoed in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of testing in the wilderness. Psalm 95. Jesus had his day of testing in the wilderness, or should I say his 40 days of testing in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. That testing was to go and do what Adam could not do, resist the devil. Jesus also did what Israel, as God's chosen nation, could not do. Their checkered history of their 40 years sojourn through the wilderness is well documented with one failing after another. Even Moses wasn't allowed to cross into the promised land on account of his failings in the wilderness. Once the children of Israel entered the Holy Land, their track record as a settled nation really didn't fare much better. And in some cases, it was much worse. And on account of their rampant corruption and persistent idolatry, God had to discipline them, finally, as the loving father that he is. He disciplined them by exiling them to Babylon, the Babylon captivity of the church. God's people were in exile. Exile. Does that sound familiar? Adam and Eve were exiled from Eden, where Adam had once given names to all the friendly, at that time, cuddly animals. Now in exile, the newlyweds faced a hostile planet where the brutality of the wild beasts was a constant threat and a constant reminder of their far-reaching, catastrophic blunder that they both committed by listening to a snake, excuse me, a snake, (laughs) Maybe they made a rattlesnake steak out of it. I don't know. I heard it's good. But they listened to that snake instead of listening to the voice of God. Now, against this dark backdrop, one of the bright details that stands out in Isaiah's vision of a beautifully transformed wilderness is, quote, no lion shall be there, 
and a lion. I submit to you, there is no lion there in Isaiah's picture of a new Eden, if you will, because Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, went head on and won in his showdown against that wilderness lion, the one Peter describes as your adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, Peter continues, standing firm in the faith. James adds his two cents in chapter 4. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Jesus successfully resisted the devil, unlike the rest of us. And so we stand firmly in faith in him, not in our own track record. And Jesus freely gives us his victory over the devil. By forgiving us all our sins, Jesus leaves the devil no thorns on which to hang his satanic accusations against us. And instead of thorns, we bear now the fruit of the Spirit. This fruit of the Spirit that's produced in the new life of faith. Faith in Jesus. And as if all that weren't enough, Jesus also shares with us his victory over sin and its wages. Death. Our resurrected and ascended Savior tells us, because I live, you also shall live, even though you die. And that always sounds better, has a better ring to it, spoken by someone who actually rose from the dead. Yes, Jesus is changing the landscape, taming the wilderness both within and without. Now, in the new heavens and the new earth, if there are to be any lions, it will be the kind that Isaiah described in last week's Old Testament lesson from Isaiah. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and the wolf will lie down with the lamb, and a child shall play with the cobra, just like Adam first did with the innocent critters in the garden before the fall. Woody Allen's line and all that was, yes, that little lamb might be lying down with the wolf, but it's not going to get much sleep. Well, we're not quite there yet, are we? Now, Paul says, we see through a glass dimly, but then we shall see face to face. If Isaiah's Holy Spirit-inspired picture of the new creation is even just a faint trace of the reality behind it that's awaiting all of us, children of the Heavenly Father, then I say, bring it on but in your perfect timing, Lord. In the meantime, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now may he who began a good work in you bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, now as we continue our worship, we'll ask the ushers to come forward for the offering. Confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Mm-hmm. 
It's almost there. Here we go. Together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was crucified also for us. Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Lord, life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead. It was on that night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, betrayed when he broke bread with his disciples. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this and remember to me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he blessed it, he gave to him, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. You may be seated. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil life, now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with 
with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So make me your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. this true body and true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and sustain you in the true Christian faith to life everlasting. Go in peace and with joy. Your sins have been forgiven. Please rise for prayer. Father of all mercies, the visitation of your son has enlightened the darkness of our hearts and every corner of creation. Hear us as we pray in his name and according to his will. O God, you have sent messengers to prepare the way of your son's coming. Grant us all ears to hear and hearts to believe the words delivered by pastors and all who bear your word. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you have instituted the home to be a refuge for husbands and wives and a place of growth and safety for children. Look with favor upon the homes of our land and grant that the faith might be delivered from one generation to the next, Lord, in your mercy. Righteous Lord, you rule over all things in heaven and on earth until that day when your son comes in glory to usher in his kingdom. Give wisdom and insight to all our leaders that we may live peaceable lives. Bring to repentance tyrants and despotic rulers, we pray. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, the prophet Isaiah looked for the day when blind eyes would see, deaf ears would hear, lame legs would leap and mute tongues sing until the final day of restoration. Draw near to all who have requested uh, prayers and are in need, especially those that we silently name in our hearts right now.
Lord, give them healing according to your gracious will. Bind up those who grieve that they may look for the resurrection of all flesh. Lord, in your mercy. With great jubilation, O Lord, we rejoice at your son's gracious visitation in his body and blood and the fellowship of this altar. Grant us faith to have received him worthily as he comes in this foretaste of the Lamb's marriage feast. Lord, in your mercy. O God, your love invites us to rejoice in your goodness in every circumstance of life. Teach us the joy that comes from knowing your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and eagerly expecting his gracious return the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit and who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing from the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, Lord look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace.
Go in the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see some of you at the Christmas party. Have a great week. And next Saturday for the Christmas program rehearsal, 10 o'clock right here in the Fellowship Hall. Lots Please of Please come, stuff. kiddos. Jesus bless your day. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your luncheon. And Tom has an announcement. Helpful hands, willing hearts. You're in the right place. All right, good girl.